Growing up, I would often spend weekday afternoons with my grandmother while my parents were at work. She showed me TV shows like I Love Lucy and Gilligan's Island, as well as movies like Casablanca, Stagecoach, and Some Like It Hot, and so much more. I enjoyed watching this stuff when I was a kid, but as I got older, I realized that movies were quite a bit different from when the time my grandmother was growing up. And I often wondered how we went from this... Now, oh, now. He's looking at you, kid. To this. Does he look like a bitch? What? <laughs> Does he look like a bitch? No! To understand how we got to our current stage of entertainment media in the United States, I think we have to take a look back at what I think is the most influential part of American cinema. The American New Wave, or New Hollywood. To understand how this era had such a huge impact, we have to look at a few distinct key factors. One of the biggest factors is the abandonment of the Hayes Code, named after Will H. Hayes, who was the president of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America Association from 1922 to 1945. Under Hayes' leadership, what eventually became the MPAA, or the Motion Pictures Association of America, adopted the production code in 1930, and began rigidly enforcing the rules in the mid-1930s. The production code spelled out what was acceptable and unacceptable content for motion pictures produced for a public audience in the United States. This self-censorship law restricted filmmakers from showing nudity, criminals in a positive light, drug use, homosexuality, and many other acts deemed immoral at the time. However, by the late 1960s, enforcement had become more difficult and the production code was abandoned entirely. The MPAA developed a rating system that allowed viewers to choose for themselves what was acceptable or not acceptable for them to watch. Another key factor in the American New Wave is actually derived from a different film movement that happened a decade before it in France. This influential film movement was actually titled The French New Wave, and was made up of film directors who took their influences from the golden age of cinema and took the established rules of that era and flipped them on their head and developed a new way of filmmaking. These new techniques that they developed included things like de-emphasized plot and dialogue that was oftentimes improvised, jump cuts, shooting on location rather than in a studio, handheld cameras, long uninterrupted takes, and direct sound with available light. Influential directors in the French New Wave included people like Jean-Luc Godard and Francois Truffaut. Film criticism also played an important part in the French New Wave. One film critic in particular, André Bazin, developed the idea of camera stylo or camera pen style, insisting the director is in charge of pinning the idea, blocking the scenery, and conveying the overall message of the film. We now refer to this idea as the auteur theory, which argues that the director is the single voice of the film, or the author of it. One of the last big factors we'll be taking a look at in the creation of the American New Wave was the United States vs. Paramount Pictures in 1948. This landmark case broke up the movie studio's tight hold on the theater industry. This court case accused the studios of violating the Sherman Antitrust Act and their total control over movie distribution and exhibition to theaters. At the time, seven major studios controlled all of the country's movie theaters, either through ownership of their own theater chains or through a process known as block booking. In this process, independent theater owners signed contracts with studios that required them to show a given number or a block of films. This made it so smaller independent movie companies could now produce their films and get them played in any theater. Now that we know a little bit about how the American New Wave got started, Let's take a look at some of the most important movies of the era. You know, for a lot of people of my, uh, for lack of a better word, generation, um, the c movies of the 70s, the cinema of the 70s, is the cinema of Hollywood. But what people don't talk about that often is the fact that the cinema of the 70s really started in 1967 with the release of Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde was released in 1967 at the very beginning of the New Hollywood movement. It was the story of the true-life criminal couple that went on a robbery spree in the 1930s. The film was set in the 1930s, but had a lot more to say about modern-day America than it did the decade that it took place in. It took a look at things like glorified violence in the media, crime, sex, and even alluded to the fact that one of the main characters was possibly gay, all subjects considered taboo at the time. 
And sorry to spoil a film that came out 40 years ago, our two main characters die in a bloody shootout that can disturb even the most modern and desensitized viewers. I think the impact of Bonnie and Clyde can best be summarized from a BBC article from Luke Buckmaster. While everybody still talks about the impact of Bonnie and Clyde's most risque moments, especially those breathtaking final images, the film's influence extends even further than revolutionizing screen violence. Bonnie and Clyde shook the very foundations of Hollywood, playing a major role in the steering of the U.S. film industry towards a new, exciting, history-defining direction. You know, Billy, we blew it. What? <laughs> While Bonnie and Clyde signaled a change in American cinema, a different film, Easy Rider, cemented that a new movement had arrived. Easy Rider follows two hippie motorcyclists who, after smuggling cocaine from Mexico to Los Angeles, sell their haul and receive a considerable sum of money, and decide to travel the country and end their trip in New Orleans for Mardi Gras. Easy Rider was released two years after Bonnie and Clyde in 1969, and was directed by Dennis Hopper on a small budget of $400,000 a minuscule amount of money at the time. This film used techniques like natural lighting and real locations along with handheld cameras to keep the cost low and give it its own unique feel, just like the French New Wave films. The actors also notoriously rode their own motorcycles instead of stunt double standing in and even did real drugs on screen. All these things added to the mystique of the film. This movie was able to capitalize on the counterculture movement going on at the time and really spoke to a generation reeling with change. This film struck such a chord with its audience that it ended up making almost $50 million domestically on its $400,000 budget. You see that sign, sir? Yes, you all have to leave. I'm not taking any more of your smartness and sarcasm. You see this sign? And the last film we're going to take a look at is Five Easy Pieces. While maybe not as exciting to the regular film goers as Bonnie and Clyde or Easy Rider, it still dealt with grand ideas and had its own unique style, not normally seen in Hollywood studio systems, and was directed by Bob Rafelson, who also helped produce other influential American New Wave movies such as Head and the previously mentioned Easy Rider. The film focuses on a man from an upper-class family who drops out of mainstream society to work on an oil rig and follows his journey as he wanders through life. While the story may seem meandering to some, it really focuses on the struggle with a man coming to terms with his own failures and his past. Films like this were unique for the time as they maybe didn't have a strong focus on plot and left a lot to the imagination of the viewer. This movie really seems to have a sense of realism to it. I think the importance of Five Easy Pieces was summed up best by a Variety article by Stephen Gatos. If the action-fueled hit genre films Bonnie and Clyde in 1967 and Easy Rider in 1969 were the shotgun blasts whose breakout success opened the filmmaking doors for what became known as the New Hollywood, 1970's Five Easy Pieces actually better represented the kind of filmmaking that the era's aspiring young directors, producers, writers, and actors were dreaming of making in those heady, hopeful days. These are just a few examples of what American New Wave has to offer, and there's so much more for you to explore if this era of filmmaking has sparked your interest. I'm not sure if there's a great way to end this video, other than to say that the American New Wave can still be felt through its ripple effects throughout the industry. This era of filmmaking helped bring new life into the cinemas. It helped take the rigid, stilted, melodramatic films of the past into a, an exciting new direction that often felt dangerous. And while the films that stick out in our mind may seem bombastic or filled with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, American New Wave also helped usher in a more quieter and subdued and real style of filmmaking. The New Hollywood eventually led to the independent film movement in the early 1990s, with prominent directors like Quentin Tarantino, Steven Soderbergh, and Richard Linkletter coming into their own. These and many other directors in that generation of filmmakers have been able to build upon what the American New Wave started. And time will only tell what will happen next to American films, especially now that blockbusters seem to be ruling everything. But with an oversaturation of superhero films, sequels, prequels, and remakes, it might be just time again for cinema to reinvent itself, just like that of the American New Wave.